Here's the pen. Read that. All right. Um, with photosynthesis, guys, we talked about a little bit about this equation yesterday. On the next test, there will be several questions about this equation. You need to know it. The nice thing about it is this equation is also, if you flip it around backwards, the equation for cell respiration, which there will also be things about on this next test. So really, by learning this equation, you've learned two important things. With photosynthesis, photosynthesis we defined yesterday as the, uh, the process where plants take what and convert it into what? Light to chemical. So it's a conversion of light energy to chemical energy. And usually, what form is that chemical energy in? Sugar. Sugar. Glucose. glucose in particular. So let's say glucose. And we said yesterday that plants obviously can do photosynthesis. But there's two other kinds of things that also can, at least some of them. What were they? Some bacteria. Not most, but some. And the algae. Those are our photosynthesizers. And there's a word that I don't think I used yesterday that I'm going to use today. Sometimes those kinds of things are called auto what? Trophs. Autotrophs. Which means they are essentially what does what does auto mean? Yeah, but what does auto just auto mean? Automatic self. Okay, self, like automatic. Self. And this means feeding essentially. Self feeding. Make their own food. Self feeding. Now I want to talk more about this equation. We said that the things on the back side of the arrow, what are those things called? Um, reactants. The reactants. So these are the things that plants need in order to do photosynthesis. These are the reactants. They need light. They need carbon dioxide. They need water. And we talked a little bit about yesterday about where they get these things. Obviously, the light's coming from the sun most of the time. And what, what, what part of a plant actually is kind of like a solar panel that you can capture that sunlight? The, the top part. Well, it's the leaves, but what inside the leaf? The chlorophyll. The chlorophyll. I want you to think of chlorophyll like a solar panel. Because that's sort of what it does. A solar panel captures light energy and turns it into what? No, a solar panel. What it takes light energy and converts it into like electricity, right? A, a chloroplast, the chlorophyll, chlorophyll molecule, takes light energy, essentially makes electrical energy that eventually gets turned into sugar. And we'll, we'll talk about how that works. The CO2 that a plant gets, uses. First of all, how does that CO2 get into the plant? We talked a little bit about this yesterday. How, yeah, but how do they breathe it? Where, where are their breathing holders? Bottom of their plant. Bottom of their leaves. What did we call those little breathing holes yesterday? No, try again. Stomates or stomata. Stomates. And they have a bunch of them on the bottoms of their leaves. In most cases, on the bottom. Why does it make more sense to put them on the bottom than on the top? Yeah, so they don't dry out because they're just little holes, right? And what else is coming out while the CO2 is going in? Yeah, but what, what do you not want to come out if you're a plant? It's a lot of water, right? If you had holes on the top, that bright sun would be shining on all those holes and the water inside would evaporate real fast, right? So you put them on the bottom, where well, that's not too big of an issue because it's shaded. Well, what kinds of plants might have them on the top? Those little packs. Little packs. Plants that are like floating on the top of the water because are they worried about losing water? Because it's plenty. But what about a plant like the little LEDA stuff we've been using in the lab that lives under the water? Would it, would it make sense to have holes in you if you live under the water? No. Yeah. No. Because no. you flood, right? How, how do they get CO2 if they live under the water? What have we been talking about the last couple of weeks? Diffusion. Okay? It just diffuses out of the water, okay? If you're living under the water, you can't afford to have holes. So they don't have stomates. Those aquatic plants actually live underwater. They get their gases by diffusion. But 
something that floats on top of the water like a lily pad probably has stomachs on the top. Most other plants have them on the bottom of their leaves. Can I have some? I don't know that I have. I saw one on Facebook this year that had all the plants on it. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever seen the bottom. The water plants use obviously comes in through their roots. Plants actually, most plants, have this system of vessels, sort of like your blood vessels. Anybody know what the pipes in a plant are called that actually carry water from the roots all the way up to the roots? It's called the xylem tubes. And that's the word I want you to know. Xylem. That's the set of tubes in a plant that mostly carry the water. Um, there's also a set of tubes in a plant that also they carry what? What's the other set of tubes carry? Um, it's like the tubes that carry the sugar. Carry the sugar. Anybody know what those tubes are called? called the phloem. In general, which way are things being carried in the xylem? The water's coming from, to, wait a minute, the water's coming from where? From the roots and going up to the stems and the leaves. So in general, the stuff in the xylem is running that way. But in plants, where's most all the sugar made? Where's photosynthesis mostly happening in that? In the leaves. So the flow of them is going to be going the opposite way, right? From the leaves, down to the stems, down to the roots. Those are the, called the vascular tissues of plants. That's how they carry and move nutrients throughout their body, nutrients and water and stuff. It's the flow. Water tubes, mostly for water. These are mostly for sugar. There's some other things that get carried in there too. But let's go back to our equation. So our reactants for a plant to do photosynthesis, light, CO2, water, the products, the things over here are the products. Why is the plant doing photosynthesis? It's doing it to make food. So it's doing it for this. That's the sugar, right? Carbohydrates are sugars. This is just sort of a, a waste product for most cases, right? Now, we said yesterday, do plants need oxygen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Why, does, why do most living things need oxygen gas? So they can do some respiration and make ATP. Plants do that just like you do. They need some oxygen. So why are they giving it off? They make way more than they need. So they release the extra into the atmosphere. So let's, let's know, make sure we know how to write out this equation in symbol form. So usually we're just going to write light plus CO2 plus water. What's the, what's the name for the arrow? The uh, yield. Yield sign. So light plus CO2 plus water yields. I'm going to write it in a slightly different way. I'm going to put the oxygen first. Plus. That's glucose. C6H12O6. That's sugar. And we said to balance it out so that everything balances out. Easy way to remember it's six, six, six. So we got a balanced equation. What do we call those numbers we put out in front to balance it? Coefficients. That's the balanced equation for photosynthesis. And we'll see here in a week or so that if we flip it around backwards, it's also the equation for what? Uh, cellular respiration. Right? They're, they're basically opposites of each other. Photosynthesis and cell respiration are a cycle. <laughs> let's, let's talk about that a minute while we're here. Those two processes, photosynthesis and cell respiration, basically make up what cycle? You guys may not know about this. They make up what's called the carbon cycle. Because here's the deal. How much carbon is on Earth today compared to like day one of Earth? Same amount, okay? Essentially. What's been happening to that carbon over and over and over? It's been recycled. The carbon in you might have been in George Washington. 
Oh. Might have been in a dinosaur. Might have been, <laughs> been, might have been in a pile of sports manure. Uh, uh, literally, you know, literally. Yeah. No, no, nothing to do with that. Okay. But point being, this carbon, this carbon has been used over and over and over again. It doesn't go away. It's just recycled. The processes of photosynthesis and cell respiration help us to recycle. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out of the air and puts it where? Where's the carbon get put? Out of the air into sugar. And that sugar is used to build things like plants. And animals end up eating that sugar, right? And that carbon becomes part of your carbon. It becomes part of your body. Oops. And then you die and you're decomposed and cell respiration takes these sugars and turns them back into CO2. Um, so it's just a cycle over and over and over and over again. Perfect. Let's talk a little bit more about photosynthesis before we head to the lab. We talked yesterday about all the energy on Earth, essentially, there's a couple of exceptions, but pretty much all the energy on Earth comes from the sun. When you eat, a, when you eat cow, when you eat beef, you're still eating sun energy, right? Because the cow and grass that got energy from the sun. So you just got it a couple steps along the way, but you're still eating sun energy, one way or the other. We, we already talked about autotrophs. And we said those things are self-feeders. Most of the time, autotrophs are things that do photosynthesis. And again, we said plants, uh, some bacteria, algae, they're the things that do photosynthesis. Now, there is another way to be an autotroph, though, at least one other way, maybe more. But there's a process called chemosynthesis. Where would photosynthesis not be possible? Where there's no sunlight. Where there's no sunlight. Which on Earth might be where? All right, maybe caves. That's not what I'm thinking, though. What I'm thinking is way deep in the ocean. There's some things that live way down there deep in the ocean where essentially no light gets. Um, fish that can't see, so can they do that? No, no. This, this process is usually a bacterial thing. And it's where bacteria use chemicals coming out of volcanic vents. They use the energy from those chemicals to make sugar. So it's a lot like photosynthesis. They're still making sugar, but the original energy isn't coming from the sun. It's coming from these volcanic... Uh, chemicals coming out of the volcanic vent. So we're talking way deep in the ocean. You are not an autotroph, right? You're a heterotroph. Which means you have to feed from what does hetero mean? What's hetero mean? From, from different, different thing. You have to feed from something different than yourself. You have to eat. Heterotrophs have to eat. And to be a heterotroph, you could be a herbivore. What's herbivore mean? Plants. You're a vegetarian. You only eat plants. You could be a carnivore. You could only eat meat. Or you could be an omnivore, which is what most of us are, right? Which means what? We eat a little bit of everything. Um, you know, when you when you think about true carnivores, you might think about lions and tigers. Not bears. And bears, and bears oh my, right? But, but bears are not, right? Bears eat a lot of stuff. Bears eat berries, they eat roots, they eat all kinds of stuff. Occasionally they'll eat meat, but, but they, they're more omnivore. They, they'll eat a little bit of everything. Yeah. Just like you said that herbivores, like the ones that only eat plants, they kill the dips, but they have to go about certain ones. It's the same way with carnivores. Well, not, not for protein, because when, when you eat meat, you're getting all 20 amino acids that you need to make all your proteins. You, know, you do need some vitamins and some minerals, which you're going to have to get from somewhere else. Probably. But it depends on the animal. Let's talk about this. Now, here's some big numbers. Scientists have estimated that every year, plants and bacteria and algae take 600 billion tons of carbon dioxide out of the air. 600 billion tons. Now we're talking about a gas. 
That's a lot of gas, right? 600 billion tons. That's a hard number to think about. Right. Tons, 2,000 pounds. So we're talking about 600 billion times 2,000. That's a lot of pounds of CO2. And that they release on average about 400 billion tons of oxygen. Why aren't those numbers even? Because in the equation it was... So in the equation, it was for every six CO2s you took in, you gave off six, right? Six oxygens. So it's six and six. Why aren't those numbers equal? It's CO2 and O2. CO2 must do what? It's got an extra C, which means it weighs more, right? Probably that's heavier. It's got a carbon in there that the oxygen doesn't have. That's, that's the main difference. The C makes CO2 a little bit heavier than oxygen. There was a guy back a long time ago, I, I don't know the year, but a Ger that's a German name, right? Von Helmut. Um, von Helmut. Um, back at this point in time, and let me ask you this question. I want you to write this down on your paper. Here's a scenario. I saw this teaching video where they asked this question. And they, they were asking this question to people who had just graduated from Harvard. They were, it was on graduation day at Harvard. They had on their caps and gowns and all those kind of stuff. Smart people. And it was, so they were really smart people. And they had this little block of wood with them, the people asking the question. It was like a, a piece of firewood. So it was dried out wood. And here's the question I'm going to ask you guys. And I want you to write your answer down. It's multiple choice. They had this piece of firewood and they would take it around and they would hand it to the person. They would let them hold it, fill the piece of firewood. Kind of feel how heavy it was. And, and they would say, most of the, the weight of this wood, where did it come from originally? And, and they would give them a multiple choice. So hold, hold that thought. Here was the multiple choice. Most of what this wood is now made of, most of this dried out piece of wood, where did it come from? And the, the, the choices were from the air, from uh, the ground, or from water. Those are the three choices. I want you to write down what you think. And let me state the question one more time. You got a piece of dried out firewood. You're, you're, you're holding the piece of wood in your hand. You're feeling the heaviness of it. And their question is, most of what this piece of wood is now made out of, where did it come from originally? Was it in the air? Did it come from the ground? Did it come from what? You said originally. Originally. Where did the plant get it from? Oh. Where did the plant get it from? Oh, oh. So, so right now, what you think? And we're going to make you hold up your hand and vote here in a minute. So everybody's got to vote. Yeah, a piece of dried out firewood. Most of the weight of that piece of wood. Where did the plant get that from to make that piece of wood? Did it get it from the air? The ground? Got it. Or from water? <laughs> All right, so let's let's take a vote. Take a vote. Hold up your hand if you think it came from the air. All right, you got a vote. Hold up your hand. So we got one, two, three, four, five votes for air. How many say it came from the ground? One, two. You already voted. Yeah, I'm just all three. It's not all three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, what about the water? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, our results here are sort of like they were for the people with Harvard. The one that got the least people to vote for it is the right answer. I knew it, because it gets carbon. Most, most of the tree, most of the tree came from the air. So Tom, let's go back to this equation. CO2. That's the main gas involved in carbon in the plants take in for photosynthesis. This carbon right here and this oxygen right here, where do they end up over here on this side? Where does that carbon and that, that O2 end up over here on this side? There's the carbon. There's the oxygen. This glucose goes on to make up a plant, right? 
That's what most of the plant's made out of. Different combinations of glucose molecules. The only thing that it got from the water is what? The hydrogen. And what if you turn around and look at the periodic table, hydrogen's like the lightest element, right? It's element number one. It's gonna weigh hardly anything. Carbon's kind of heavy, oxygen's kind of heavy. Most of wood is made of that. The carbons came from the CO2. The oxygens came from CO2. Where did this oxygen come from? No, the water. It came from the water. Turns out the water gets split during the process. The plant needs these hydrogens over here, and the water is released. The oxygen, rather, is released for things to breathe. So most of a tree, most of a plant, came from air. What do you think most people thought in Von Helmut's time? Ground. Most people thought it came from stuff out of the ground. Yeah. So, so here's what Von Helmut did. He took a, a big thing of dirt. He weighed the dirt. Put it in a big container. He took a tree, a, a tree, a seedless sapling. Weighed the sapling. Planted it. Gave it water. Uh, let it grow for several years. When it, when it got to the right time, he took all the parts of the tree out of the dirt. All the stuff above the ground, all the roots, took all that out, weighed it, and then he reweighed the dirt. He let it dry out first. He, he weighed it first when it was dry, and then after he was done, he weighed it again dry. What did he find about the weight of the dirt after compared to before? It was almost the same. A little bit less, but almost the same. What, what are plants taking out of the dirt? Minerals like magnesium, they need some chlorophyll, they need some copper, some zinc. But we're talking small amounts. What a plant gets from the ground is sort of like what you might get from what? Like when you take a vitamin. So sort of the same kind of thing. A plant, when a, what a plant's getting from the ground is what you get, get from when you take like a vitamin pill. Minerals and different organic materials. But not much of anything. Um, so the most of the plant made out of carbon dioxide, which the plant used to make sugar. Does air have weight? Yeah, air has weight. A lot of people think air doesn't weigh anything. You take uh, take one of those propane tanks like you um, use for your uh, gas grill at home. Probably not a good idea. But let me finish my When it's when it's empty, it's pretty light, right? Tanks that propane is when you fill it up with gas, though, it gets heavy. Um, and you could, now this is a bad idea, but you could, you could put it on a scale and open up the valve and watch what happened. No, don't, don't put any matches on it. You could watch the weight go down as the air was coming out. Right? That'd be a bad idea. You don't want to do that. You know what air is? You don't have to do it in your house, though. Bad idea to do it anyway, because this is a waste of the propane. But, but regardless, air has weight. And that weight can build something like a huge sequoia tree. Um, those things are stories and stories tall. All right, but in the tank, it builds up pressure. Yeah. All right, so let's let's finish up, and then we'll get into the lab here in a minute. Photosynthesis, as we said before, happens mostly in the leaves of a plant. So let's let's pretend like we're zooming in on a plant. You're looking at the whole plant, and now we're going to zoom in on the leaf, and then we're going to zoom in on a cell of the leaf, and then we're going to zoom into that cell. What are the parts of a plant cell that actually do the photosynthesis? The chloroplast. The chloroplast, right? Those are the organelles where photosynthesis happens, the chloroplast. So we're going to talk about chloroplasts for a minute. Plants have them. Most other things don't, correct? Right? Some algae have them. But they're basically containers for what? What's, what's inside a chloroplast? Chlorophyll. chlorophyll. Which is what? What is chlorophyll? Green pigments. It's a green pigment that acts sort of like what? Solar panel. Solar panel. It absorbs light. But does it, does, it, does it absorb all light equally? No. What kinds of light is chlorophyll good at absorbing? Good at absorbing the blues and the reds. Not very good at all at absorbing what? Green. Greens. Yeah. That's actually my next question. He just thought, he thought of a good question. He's, what he's saying is, plants should be black. 
Think about it. Hey, Bob, Cindy, think about it. Because what, what do we say? What do we say? Black means. It means they're absorbing all colors of light. Seems like that would make sense for a plant to be black, right? Because that would mean it's absorbing more light, and therefore it should be able to do more photosynthesis, grow faster, grow bigger. That makes sense. Any any ideas why that might not be a good idea? It will get too much sun. Think for a second. Your plant, you can't move. You're stuck where you're at. And, and let's say let's let's say that we took a Leah outside and we planted a Leah and she starts to grow in the plant. Right? That one. That one. She's got very she's got dark skin and she got on a black shirt. Okay? She's a plant. She's absorbing lots of light. If she was a plant, she could do lots of photosynthesis. But a lot of that energy she absorbs before it gets used is going to get turned into white. What do we say it's a bad idea to go outside on a summer day with that black shirt on? It gets absorbed, it gets turned into heat. Does the plant have any good way to cool itself off? Can it go get in the shade? <laughs> no, it is the shade, right? It can't go get in the shade. So a lot of people think that the reason plants never evolve like pigments to make them black is that they would they would heat up too fast and they would die of overheating. So they absorb some of the light, but not all of it, and that's one way that they can sort of maintain a constant temperature. Right. They don't absorb the green. They so reflect the green. If they were black, they would absorb all of the colors. Right, so we wouldn't. We would when our when our brain doesn't see any light coming off of anything, we interpret it as black. That's also the black is just a made up color. Why would a plant be black? Because it would be absorbing all the colors of light, and therefore it could do photosynthesis faster. Yes. Well, because you're not absorbing as much light when you're in the shade. The plants are blocking it off. Yeah, but I thought the shade was... So. No, the shade is just where the light's being blocked off. So you're not getting as much light. Okay. Yeah. How come, how come what now? I can know where I'm getting any heat now. In here? Well, one, the air is turned down pretty low. And, and you are absorbing a lot of that light. It's just the light, the, the intensity of the light in here is not bright like it would be on, out in the sun. Right? It's not getting near as much light. All right, let's talk about chloroplast. Focus on me. I'm going to show you a picture of a chloroplast. So here's, here's a picture of a leaf. We're going to zoom in on that leaf. But before we do, notice right down here on the bottom of the leaf, like right here, what are we looking at? There's a pore. That's the stomach. That's the hole. And you see CO2 going in and oxygen coming out. That's how they breathe. But I want us to, here's a chloroplast. So there's, there's bunches of these in each plant cell in the leaf, right? We looked at those Elodea plants a while back. And all those little green dots we saw in those cells were what? Chloroplast. Here's just one of them. This is one chloroplast. Yeah. In this kind of detail, yes. Yes. But inside this chloroplast are these little little discs. They look like little pancakes, green pancakes. And those little green pancake like things are called thylakoids. Join me. The thylakoids are where chlorophyll is at. Chlorophyll is a, is a protein that gets embedded, it's stuck into the membranes of these thylakoids. So it's, remember all those proteins we talked about that are stuck into the cell membrane? Those blue things we saw in the pictures of the cell membrane? Sort of with the way chlorophyll works in the thylakoid. Chlorophyll stuck in the membrane. The thylakoids are really sort of like the solar panels of the plant. And notice the thylakoids get stacked up. They're in like a stack of pancakes. And a stack of them is called a granum. These are terms you might want to write down. Each little, each little dislike thing is a thylakoid. It's where the chlorophyll's at. It's in the membrane of the thylakoid. 
a stack of thylakoids is called a granum. And notice there's lots of stacks inside that chlor chloroplast. There's bunches of thylakoids inside there. And then in between all these thylakoids and granum is this fluid that fills it up, sort of like what part of the cell? It's the part that, the part that fills up the cell, fluid like cytoplasm. Cell. cytoplasm. So we're going to call that stuff the stroma inside the chloroplast. Sort of like the cytoplasm in the cell, fills up the inside. It's between all the granum and the chloroplast. This is where photosynthesis happens inside the chloroplasts, which again are inside what? Inside cells, cells that are found where? In what part of the plant? The leaves. The leaves. The stroma is the fluid-like substance that fills up the chloroplast. So again, this is one chloroplast. In a plant cell, there are bunches of these. Inside that chloroplast are these little bags pancake-like things called thylakoids. In their membranes is where chlorophyll's at. A stack of them is a granum, and the fluid-filled space inside is the shore. All right, so here's a couple of questions. I want you to write down your answer to this question on your sheet of paper. Just A, B, C, or D. Right, write down your answer to the question. Eventually, we're going to break into the clicker things and we'll start using them and you click in your answers. Uh, but I forgot to get that set up today, so we'll do it this way today. Write down what you think your answer to this question is. So what is it? Right, sure. What's the answer? It's B. Carbon dioxide, water, life. Three things that plants need to do photosynthesis. Here's another question. Which of the following organisms cannot do photosynthesis? Write down your answer. Write, write it down. Let's see. What is it? C. Fungus. What does cyano mean? We talked a little bit about cyan the other day. What's cyano mean? Blue color. Bluish, greenish, right? Sometimes these things are called the blue-green algae. They're not really algae, but they're bacteria that can do photosynthesis. Algae can, so can plants. How do fungus get their food? They, they eat stuff. A lot of times it's dead stuff. Not always dead stuff. There are, there are a lot of fungus that can cause disease, right? There's athlete's foot. That fungus is growing on you. Uh, ringworm is a fungal infection. That thing is eating you. Um, there's all kinds of fungi that grow on living plants. They're eating the plant. All right, one more question here. And this is something we didn't talk about, so we'll talk about this before we try to answer the question. Photosynthesis happens in two main steps. It's the way we usually divide it out. There's the light-dependent part. And guess what the other part would be? The light-independent part. The light dependent part has to happen first. And this is the part where the plant is absorbing the sunlight, right? Well, if the plant's absorbing the sunlight, where's that got to happen? What are the parts of the plant that absorb the sunlight? The chloroplast. Okay. Which, in particular, here, what's the answer? What were the things inside the chloroplast that we just talked about? Uh, the this, this is where chlorophyll is at. This is where the solar panels of the plant are. Chlorophyll absorbs light in those little pancake-like stacks inside the chloroplast, the thylakoid membranes. All right, I want to show you one other thing, and then we will take a break for today. All right, this diagram right here. This is called an absorption spectrum. Absorption spectrum. And it's showing you essentially what chlorophylls will absorb. So plants actually have two different kinds of chlorophylls that are slightly different shades of green. They're both green, slightly different shades. We're going to see those shades here in a minute in the lab we're about to do. One of them's sort of an olive green, one of them's a real green, like dark green. 
Let's look first at the one that says chlorophyll A, which is in blue up here. This is trying to show you that if purplish blue light is shining on chlorophyll, what happens? It absorbs well. All right, but then as, as the color starts moving toward greenish, what starts to happen to, to the absorption? It drops way down. So from green to yellow, the plants essentially absorb it almost none of that, right? That greenish yellow, at least the chlorophyll is right. The, the sun is giving off white light, which is red, blue, and green all mixed together. But essentially, now when you get over to the orange part, orange is red. That's what the plant. That's when the plant starts absorbing again, right? So plants are good at absorbing orangey red and purplish blue. They're terrible at absorbing greenish and yellow. Which kind of light is the most common light coming out of the sun? Well, yellow. 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 Greenish. Yellow. Okay, yellow. Yep. Okay. That's why you got for it. Most of the light coming out of the sun is right in there. So why are plants absorbing that? Because it's green. What do, we, what do we say would might be a problem if they absorb too much? They will not. They'd get too high. So, so if they absorb this this kind of light, they'd probably overheat and die. What do they do to this kind of light? Reject it. They reflect it. What kind of light can you see the best? What color of light can you see the best? White. Are you talking about yellow? What color of light is the human eye the best at seeing? Yeah, like green, green, black, blue. Oh, okay. You ever notice that uh, the the lights along the road, the street lights, mm -hmm. are that color? Oh, yeah. Kind of a greenish. Now, so there are the older orange ones, but a lot of them are that greenish yellow. There was a there was a movement back in like the late eighties to change the color of fire trucks to that color. Well, kind of an ugly greenish yellow, but but the idea was people will see them coming. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about the color of, of that jacket right there. You see that, right? Um, you see it coming. The, the human eye has evolved to see because that's what the sun is putting out the most. That makes sense. But but if you're a plant, it probably doesn't make sense to absorb that because it'd be too much. And you'd absorb too much, and you'd get too high. So, yeah, that's what we're talking about. The highlight chartreuse is what they call it. But yeah, they're really ugly. Um, it didn't catch on because people were used to red fire trucks, and the movement just sort of died away. But it makes sense to make them that color um, because we're we're a lot better at seeing this color than we are at seeing this color. All right, one other thing that I want to address here. You just said that was the last way. Uh, I changed oh, my mind. All right, here we're looking at what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum. These things are essentially different forms of what? Can you want us to write this? Um, here's what the They're is. different, essentially the different forms of light. There are kinds of light that you can't see, right? Lots of them. Turns out you can only see this little bitty part of the light spectrum. That's what we call visible light. All these other things are forms of electromagnetic radiation or light that we can't see. Since they're forms of light, though, how do they all move? Through the spectrum wave. They all move at what speed? Wavelengths. How about the speed of light? Right. Which is really fast. That's the speed of light. Now let's let's write that out in more uh, without without the scientific notation for a second. That means take a three and do what with it? What does that times ten to the eighth mean? Put eight zeros behind it. So that is three hundred million. 300 million of these every second is how fast light goes. 300 million times that 
every second. It's meters per second. Just to give you a, um, a comparison, what else is really fast? Sound. Sound is really fast. Any idea how fast sound goes? It's like That's sound. <laughs> this is light. This is this would be like three times ten to the second, right? This is three times ten to the eighth. So essentially, light is a million times faster than sound. Sound's really fast. Light's a million times faster. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you always see the lightning way before you hear the thunder. The light is traveling way faster. That's why, yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow your mind with something in a minute, probably. So just, just be patient. Don't um, take Yeah, go ahead. Does that mean that the lightning actually does make sound? The thunder is a product of lightning. Yes. Because the light's moving way faster than the sound. See the light way before you hear the sound. Because. Lights a million times faster than two. Yes, right, let me finish where I was going with this. These are all forms of light. When we're talking about waves, light moves in a wave-like pattern, right? And there's some debate about how it moves, but when we're talking about waves, a couple things you ought to know about a wave. If we took a point on a wave, and we go, we follow that wave. So the wave goes up, and it goes down here. And about right here, what happens? It starts over, right? What do we call this distance between a point on one wave and the same point on the next wave? That's called a wavelength. And you might know what the symbol for that is. It looks sort of like an upside down Y, but it's a Greek letter, lambda. Looks sort of like an upside down Y there, lambda. That's the symbol for wavelength. How long is the wave? Now, if we're talking, if we're talking light, how long are we talking for most forms of light that we would deal with on a normal basis? The light that we normally would talk about when we measure the wavelength in meters. Usually we're going to measure it in nanometers. What's a nanometer? Probably take this and divide it into a billion pieces. Billions of them. So most most of the light waves that we deal with on a normal basis are really really small. They have short wavelengths. But another thing that we need to think about is what's called the frequency. What's the frequency of something? Um, we talk about the frequency uh, that um, that um, Robert here has to go to the bathroom. Does that mean he's what? He got up. He asked? The frequency that he asked to get up and leave class and go to the bathroom. That's how often he asked, right? How often something happens. It's frequency. So if we talk about the frequency of a wave, we're talking about how many of those waves repeat every way, every section. Frequency. We just usually use the F for that. So sometimes there's just a really important equation about light that you need to be familiar with. Remember, this is a wavelength. This is frequency. Anybody know what the C stands for? The C stands for the speed of light. And why, why they use C for speed of light? There's not even a C in there, right? Why, why, why they use C for that? Because it's constant. Okay? C stands for constant. It's the speed of light. Now here's the thing. If you look at this diagram, do all forms of light have the same wavelength? No. Nope. Do all forms of light have the same frequency? No. Nope. So let's look at what that means. And let's start up here at the, the top of this diagram. Notice it says as we go up, the waves get what? Longer. Radio waves, like the waves that our radio uh, station is transmitting. 
those are really long. Those are like maybe up to like a hundred meters long. Really long waves. Hundred of these over a football field. So if if it, if it's got a really high wavelength, what does that mean about its frequency? It's got to be lower because these two numbers always have to multiply together to be the same thing, right? This is always three times ten to the eight for life. So if this goes up, this has to go down. What's the word for that? When one variable goes up and the other one goes down. Say again? No, not directly. If one goes up and the other one goes down, what's the word for that? What kind of proportional? No? One goes up, the other goes down. What's it called when you take a fraction and you flip it? Oh, yeah, there's another word though. In what? Inverse. Invert. Okay? So these are inversely proportional. Inverse means split. One goes up, the other goes down. So up here, these waves have a high wavelength, but a low what? Frequency, because they're inverses. Down here at the very bottom, these waves are really short. They have a very low wavelength, but therefore a very high frequency. Now, think about radio waves for a minute. A lot of you probably thought a radio station was in an LA. Sound. Why wouldn't that work? One, it doesn't travel all that well. But two, sound is traveling fast, but not that fast, right? So if you were listening to a radio station out of, say, Birmingham, when the guy down there said, good morning, what are you hearing? Nothing. You hear static for a, a little time. And then you hear good morning way later. It would be a delay. But if he's, talking, if he's sending out a light signal when he says good morning, you hear good morning almost instantaneously, right? Because the light is traveling crazy, crazy fast. Way faster than sound. Radio, your radio in your car receives a light signal and your radio converts it to what? A sound signal. That's the way radio radios work. They receive a light signal traveling at the speed of light. They convert it into sound so you can hear it. Um, I'm not going to go into how that works exactly, but yeah, go ahead. No, they're blinking because they don't want our airplane to run into them. Yeah, that's why they're blinking. Now, this, they, we can't see radio waves, right? They're invisible. Can't see them. They're just there. Are there radio waves in this room right now? Yes. Yeah. We turned on a radio, we can pick up a lot of stations, right? Are we concerned about that? Are they dangerous? No. No. Are some of these forms of light dangerous? It turns out, and this is something important, something that's something real important for you to understand, the amount of energy that's in a wave is directly proportional to what property of that wave? The amount of energy that a wave of light has is directly proportional to its frequency. So these up here have a very low frequency, which means they have not very much light. Not very much energy. If, if, a, if a radio wave bumps into you right now, which it probably is, what happens? You don't feel it. Nothing happens. It bounces off. No, no harm, no foul. But if we go down to the other side of the light spectrum, are there gamma rays in this room right now? Probably a few, but if there were too many, we'd be in trouble. Because these are the... The types of waves given off by what? Um, Radioactive things like nuclear missiles and such. Okay. Um, this stuff has a really crazy high frequency and therefore crazy amounts of what? Energy. And if, if I had a if this was a if this was a gamma ray gun, and I pointed here at Michael. What would happen? It would go straight through Michael. It would go straight through Robert, straight through Julia, straight through Leah. 
probably straight through that wall and then straight through whoever's in that next class. Okay? It's got crazy amounts of energy. And as it's going through you, what's it doing to you? It's frying your insides and mutating your DNA and causing all kinds of crazy stuff to happen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, they can, no, they can, they can make things vibrate. That's what the ways you do that. But, but anyway, listen, gamma rays can penetrate most things, right? What, well, what might you use to try to block gamma rays? Lead. You might choose choose really thick, like lead walls, really thick concrete and lead walls. But even then, some of it might get through. Going up to the next one up the list, X rays. Like when the X rays, they keep that lead. Yep. X-rays are also really high frequency, really low weight. Um, wavelength, okay? Which means they have lots and lots of weight. High frequency means they also have high weight. What do we say is directly proportional to the frequency? Energy. So when you go to the dentist and he gives you a, an X-ray, He's shooting this light beam through your head, right? And it's got lots of energy. So it's going through your skin. Now, it doesn't have as much energy as gamma rays. So when it, it, when it hits bone, what happens? It reflects. What, what does the doctor have on the other side of the bone? A piece of film or some kind of camera, right? And they pick up that reflection. And that's how they take a picture of your bones. Um, are x-rays dangerous? Yes. Some, yes. They're radioactive. Okay. And there's been lots of studies that show the more x-rays you have in your life, the more likely you are to get what? Cancer. Cancer. Um, it's kind of, kind of dangerous. Now, now let's go on up to UV light. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet light's coming from the sun, right? Some of it is. But ultraviolet is still dangerous. Um, it has a, still has a high, high frequency, a low wavelength, lots of energy. How many, how many of you ladies go to the tanning bed? Oh. And, and I'm not going to ask how many guys, because if you're a guy and you go, you just lost all man points. For you, okay? You're zero on the man point list. And you go to the tanning bed. Okay? But anyway, so if you're a guy, you don't admit it to me that you go. Uh, you, la you ladies who go, not a good idea. Okay. Here's why. Join me. I'm waiting on you. Focus. As you're basking in the tanning bed, you're essentially shooting yourself with UV light, and that UV light has lots of energy. So the first few layers of your skin it goes straight through, okay? and as it's going through, it's going through the DNA in those cells, and it may cause the DNA in those cells to mutate. Well, what happens sometimes with mutated DNA? It may cause those cells to die. It may cause those cells to become cancerous. And you get different kinds of skin cancer. Now, realistically, mo are most forms of skin cancer a huge deal? Most forms are. Most, most times you get skin cancer, you go get it cut off, and that's the end of it. But one of the most dangerous forms of cancer that exists is a kind of skin cancer called melanoma. And UV light can cause that. And it, it will start off in your skin, but it spreads all throughout your body and it can kill you. So when you're when you're in a tanning bed next time, think about that. As you're sitting there and basking in the UV rays, think about it. Um, now there are all kinds of myths about tanning bed. Like for for example, that if you're a pregnant woman and you're in a tanning bed, you're going to cause harm to your child. True or false? Probably false. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. UV rays, UV have, rays have a lot of energy, but not enough to what? Not enough to penetrate deep. They can penetrate through the first few layers of your skin, but they can't go through the uterus and into a baby. They, 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 they can't do it. They don't have enough energy. Now, if you were sitting in, a, in an x-ray machine, that'd be different, right? But you're not. You're just getting UVs. It's dangerous to you. It's not going to hurt the baby inside you. Uh, but a bad idea. Then we get to visible light. 
And everybody in here has heard of Roy G. Bibb before, right? Yes. Yeah. No. Roy G. Bibb? Red, red, orange, yellow. That fits right in there, the visible light spectrum, right? Which means violet light it would be the lowest visible light on this list. Which means what about violet light? It has the most what? The most energy, the highest frequency, the lowest. High frequency means low. What's the type of light we need to keep Oh, hold on. Where have we been going for the last 10 minutes? High frequency means low, short, wavelength. All right, and then you go up to red. Red means it's got the longest wavelength and therefore the least amount of frequency, frequency and therefore the least amount of uh, power. Energy, power. In an old time, when I used to use an old timey film, which most of you probably don't do anymore, right? but like an old timey film camera, when you were developing the film, where did you develop it? They called it a dark room, but it wasn't completely dark. There was a red light in there. Why red? Red, red. If if you were trying to develop film in a, in a in a room with a violet light bulb, what would you see on the developed film? You would see a big violet mess because violet light has a lot of what? A lot of energy, enough energy to do what? Expose the film. Red light, on the other hand, doesn't. The reason they put a red bulb in there is that. Red has less energy and not enough energy to what? Make, ex expose the film. You don't see the red bulb. You don't get a picture of a red light bulb on your camera when you when you when you uh, develop it in a darker. Moving on up. Let's try to finish here. May not get into the lab today. Above above the visible spectrum is infrared. And then we get microwaves. You know, microwaves is obviously what your microwave works at on at home, but how did they come up with that, this idea of making these microwaves? <laughs> what, what were microwaves used for first? It's how, it's how places like the Navy send out their signals. Those big satellite dishes you see like on a Navy ship, it's beaming out microwave signals at the speed of light, which... Um, which uh, a receiver somewhere else would convert back into like sound or a signal. Apparently, this is, a, this is at least a myth of how somebody came up with the idea of a microwave. That somebody was standing in front of one of those microwave things. The, the transmitters. And what happened when he stood in front of it? He starts feeling really hot. Um, and what we figured out is that microwaves are really good at being absorbed by what? What's really good at absorbing microwave radiation? What what in the field? The uh, water. Yeah. Water absorbs microwaves like crazy. That's why microwaves will only work on things that are that are wet. Yeah. The the microwaves come in. The it is the water in there absorbs it. And as it absorbs those microwaves, what happens to the water? It gets really hot, it starts vibrating fast. That's what you did, right? How fast something's vibrating. So it absorbs, but a, a microwave is going to be no good on something that's dry. Because the only thing that's really good at absorbing those microwaves is water. It heats up real fast. Moving on up, we already talked about radio waves. This is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, the different forms of light. Make sure you know this equation. The speed of light is equal to the wavelength, how long is it one wave, times the frequency. How many waves happen per second? If wavelength increases, frequency has to decrease. decrease. And the higher the frequency, the higher the wave. The energy contained in that wave. That's important to know. So of the visible forms of light, again, which one has the most energy of the visible ones? Violet. Violet has the most, and what has the least? Red. Red. Green's kind of in the middle, right? All right. Um, like this. 
All right, I think I'm going to stop there. We're going to talk about the lab that we'll do tomorrow instead of today. I'll, I'll get you tested. All right.